إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرسله الله بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدى الساعة ما يفي الله ورسوله فقد رشد وما يعطي الله ورسوله فإنه لا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا ثم بعد فاشا المسلمين أوتكم نفسي أولا بتقوى الله عز وجل إن الله تعالى يقول بعد أعوذ بالله من الجسد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوى الله حق تقاته ولا تموتنا إلا وأنتم مسلمون Brothers, sisters, in today's khutbah, I want to address two problems that are plaguing the Muslim Ummah, that is hindering the establishment and the growth of Islam, doctrinal division and intellectual stagnation. There is some relationship between these two, and I will try to explore why we have these problems by referring to the formation of the four most major schools of Islamic law, the Hanafi school, the Maliki school, the Shafi school, and the Hanbali school. I would like to show in this khutbah that if we understand how the four schools of Islamic law were born, then we will see why first we should not use the minor details of Islam as platform for doctrinal division. And second, that in order to rise above this kind of doctrinal division, we have to rescue ourselves from intellectual stagnation. First, let us have some survey of the problem. Somebody comes to pray in the masjid here, but because he was praying in the way that he was taught in his country, a couple of young men who learned something about hadith are laughing with each other concerning this Muslim, look how he is praying. And then the brother reports to me that he goes out and he cannot find his shoes. They have hidden his shoes. At least he thinks they have hidden his shoes. You see, there is a kind of a suspicion and there is a kind of distance between the brothers because of these doctrinal issues. Now this is just a small example of a more, much bigger problem that we have in the entire Ummah. Muslims cannot get along with each other because we have in a masjid like this one not a single body of Muslims from any one ethnic or linguistic or geographic origin. We have Hanafis here from the indo pak subcontinent. We have Malikis here from North Africa. We have Shafis here from Egypt. We have uh, Hanbalis from Saudi Arabia. We have Muslims from all over the world. Unless we can appreciate and understand each other, our little doctrinal disputes will lead to major factions and divisions. Some people who cannot stand this kind of uh, division or difference rather among Muslims, they go and they form their own little clique. So you have masjid blossoming based on a certain ethnic or national group. That is not what Islam is really about. Islam is what you have here. Now let's understand something. Let's just go behind the scenes and witness the formation of these four major schools of law. First I want to clarify that Islam is very broad much broader than some people would think. Some people think that Islam is as narrow as a bicycle path. Some think it is even narrower still, like a mountain path. When two goats meet on a mountain path, sometimes they end up in what is called an impasse. No one can pass until they lock horns together and one knocks the other over, then he can make room for himself to pass. Some people think that Islam is like this. In order for one group of Muslims to flourish, they must knock down every other group. That's not how Islam is. I see Islam more like a multi-lane highway. There are many lanes. And I will say that the four schools of law that we're speaking about are four lanes within that multi-lane highway. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that the way is so wide that it will include everything. Because certainly in a multi-lane highway, there are some lanes which clearly are going to take you off the path. There are some exits that go in different directions. And then there are some exits that do not take you in a different direction, 
but just get you on a side road, which will just make you uh, take a little bit longer to get where you're going, but you're basically still heading in the same direction. How did these four schools come to be born? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will recall, made a hijra from Mecca, his birthplace, to Medina. It is from that hijra that we date our Islamic calendar, do we not? Now we're in 1422. That means 1422 years since the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made that hijra. Alright, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived for 10 years in Medina before he went to meet his Lord. During those 10 years, the regulations of Islam came down in the form of a revelation to him in, in the glorious Qur'an. The, uh, the, the Saum, fasting in Ramadan, Zakat, all the regulations about how to govern the state, how to live as Muslims together in the Muslim community, the laws affecting marriage and divorce, all of that came in Medina during this time. Now the Prophet wasallam left successors after him. After him was Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, and then Omar radiallahu anh, and uh, Uthman radiallahu anh, and Ali radiallahu anh. Abu Bakr, Omar, and Uthman remained in Medina, and they practiced Islam. Questions would come to them, they would answer these questions. People would have disputes among themselves, they would settle those disputes based on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and based on what they remembered from the teachings and the examples of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The book of Allah was not the only guide. The book of Allah tells you to pray, but the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us the details of how to pray. So they were praying in Medina according to these instructions from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The companions of the Prophet died. Their children lived. The children died and the grandchildren lived. In the time of the great-grandchildren, Islam was still being practiced in Medina. Islam was alive and well. Medina had been the, uh, you might say, the home and cradle of Islam. And in the time now of Al-Imam Malik, we have the time of the great-grandchildren of the Sahaba of the Prophet Wasallam. Al-Imam Malik was one of the greatest teachers in his time, well known in Medina as one of the highest intellectuals of his day. He wanted to compile a book of law that will capture the essence of the law of Islam as it was being observed and practiced in Medina. He felt that there were numerous groups and numerous factions, numerous other residents of various other towns who have a different understanding of Islam, but the understanding of Islam in Medina to him was the right understanding, because this is where you had so many companions, and now look, we have the great grandchildren of the companions of the Messenger of Allah. So surely they must know what they're doing. The way we're praying here in Medina is the way we have been praying for all these generations. So he compiled a book of hadith known as al Muwatta. It is not only collections of hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but also reports about what uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anh said, mostly what Omar said, and other scholars after them, uh, mainly the scholars from Medina. So that book reflects the practice of Medina. Now, during the ensuing time, after the Sahaba, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, a lot of time has elapsed. Sometimes people did not recall clearly what the Prophet said on an issue. Moreover, some people deliberately made up things about what the Prophet said. Factions arose. If there was a conflict between two different groups, some invented things of the Prophet to support this faction, and some invented counter sayings of the Prophet to support the other faction. So as time went by, Hadith could not be relied on in the same way as though you're hearing the Prophet speaking to you. So there had to be methods by which to grade the Hadith to differentiate between the wheat and the shape. So one of the ways that Imam Malik applied was this. He regarded the practice of Islam in Medina to be so certain, to be based on the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, that if somebody came and said, look, the Prophet wasallam said X, and if X was different from what was being observed in Medina, he would say, sorry, what is being observed here in Medina, that is the practice of the Prophet wasallam, and uh, we cannot go with what you are saying. What you are giving me here is some isolated report that we cannot depend upon, but what we are depending upon is that body of knowledge which was transmitted through the generations who live in Medina and practice Islam. So it was suggested to Al-Imam Malik that since his book is so good, it is such a worthy compilation, 
that this book should be copied and sent to different lands where everybody, all the Muslims can have access to this and they can practice Islam according to this book. But Imam Malik said no. And some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ did not stay in Medina. They went to different lands. And whatever knowledge they had from the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, they went with that. And they taught the people according to that knowledge. So let the people in the different lands act as they have been taught. They don't have to go exactly with what I have prescribed here as the, um, the, the religion as it is described in this book al -Muwasa. So let's take a journey then to Iraq and find out how Islam was being practiced there in Iraq. Then we meet uh, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. He was born some 13 years before Al-Imam Malik. So he was uh, way back in time. Al-Imam Malik was born in the year 93 according to the best report. So that would place Al-Imam Abu Hanifa's birth at the year 80. 80 years. That was a very long time ago. But that was a time that was very close to the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now in Iraq too, and particularly in Kufa, where Al-Imam Abu Hanifa was, Islam was also flourishing. This town was said to be established in the time of Umar radiallahu anh. And in fact, Abdullah bin Masood, one of the senior companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had gone to live in Kufa, and he gathered a group of students around himself. He was teaching Islam there as well. Moreover, Ali radiallahu anh, the fourth caliph of Islam, had moved the caliphate to Kufa. So there was Islam there, Islam was established, it was thriving, it was growing, it was being learned, it was being taught. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah was one of the most uh, learned men of his day in Kufa. But he didn't uh, stop with just learning from people who were available in Kufa. When he made Hajj, he learned from scholars in Mecca, he also learned from scholars in Medina. It is reported that he also sat in the classes of Imam Malik, although Imam Malik was younger than himself, he did not see it below his dignity to sit in the uh, classes of a younger teacher. So he gathered the knowledge that was available and he was teaching people in uh, Kufa. A lot of times people look at the rulings of Imam Abu Hanifa and they say, this guy didn't seem to know hadith. That's looking at it from our perspective now. Because today we have the collections of Bukhari and Muslim which came much later. And we're evaluating what Imam Abu Hanifa said based on these later compilations. But that's not fair to Al-Imam Hanifa. It's not that he didn't know the hadith. That could be possible. He couldn't, nobody says he knew everything. But the main issue was that although he knew certain things of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, he treated them as claims about what the Prophet wasallam said, claims which are not in every case dependable. For example, he would start with the Qur'an. And if the Qur'an to him showed a rule quite clear, he would not allow that rule to be bent in any way by a report from a hadith. So he would say the Qur'an is dependable, the hadith is not so dependable. So he would go with the Qur'an and he would leave aside the hadith in that case. Unless, he said, unless the hadith is reported in such a wide manner as to preclude any chance of error. Such a wide manner for him would be a mutawatir hadith for those of you who know the terminology. It just means related to so many multiple chains that since they all confirm each other, you don't expect that there's a mistake anywhere. But if a hadith is related only by one chain or two, well, there's a possibility that there are some errors. So then, he will start with the Quran. If the Quran gives you something very plainly, he will not leave that aside for the reports in the hadith. Notice that the Imam Malik would not leave aside the practice of the people of Marina for an isolated report. Now, Imam Hanifa has a different principle. He will not leave aside the Quranic injunction that is clear to him for the sake of an isolated report. Two different scholars in two different towns having two different principles by which they are now formulating the Islamic law. Now, Imam Hanifa had two famous students. Hassan al-Shaibani, Muhammad bin al-Hassan al-Shaibani, and Abu Yusuf. These two became scholars in their own right. And these two scholars sometimes differed with the Shaykh Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. Sometimes the ruling in the Hanafi school doesn't come from Abu Hanifa himself, but comes from these two scholars who are students of the master. But they themselves did not uh, think it uh, above their level to differ with their teacher, because they were also intellectuals. So when I speak about intellectual stagnation, 
Some people might think that this is a very strange statement coming from the member. But here it is. This is how the intellectuals of the earliest generation went about their business. They thought about what they're doing. They understood. In those days, thick meant understanding. Today, thick means memorization. That's the trouble that we're in. So now, all right, I mentioned the two students of Abu Hanifa for a reason. Because the third of the four major schools to be formed is that of Imam Shafi. Well, Imam Shafi died, was born six years, was born six years after the death of Imam Abu Hanifa. And so he did not have a chance to learn from Abu Hanifa directly, but he had a chance to learn from one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa, that one student known as Ashaibani. He said he was Ashaibani. But Ashaibani himself, had gone to Medina and he had studied with Al-Imam Malik, whom we already met here in Medina. Al-Shafi himself had gone and studied with Al-Imam Malik in Medina. So you see, there are lines all over the place. There is Imam Malik, there is Imam al Hanifa, two students of Abu Hanifa. One student learned from Malik. There is Shafi. Shafi learned from Malik. Shafi also learned from one student of Abu Hanifa. You see the interconnectedness. It is all one Ummah. It is not a splitting up and division, but these were intellectuals that did not just simply follow the predecessor, but they thought for themselves. Al-Imam Shafi came up with his own idea. He said, look, Abu Hanifa says one thing, Malik says another thing, the students of Abu Hanifa sometimes say something different, who are you going to believe? He said, the right way is that to solve all of this kind of difference of opinion, you just go by the hadith of the Prophet wasallam." Even if it comes through one chain, just go by that. That's more dependable than all those multiplicity of opinions, Abu Hanifa says this and Malik says this. So his principle was, you just go by the hadith. This would be a principle that would reverberate throughout Islamic history now, that would affect the schools altogether, because ideas become sometimes interconnected and interchanged. Ideas by one scholar sometimes becomes adopted by the students of another scholar. One affects the other. But that was Al-Imam Shafi's principle. That's why Al-Imam Shafi's ruling would be different. This is why if you go to a Shafi scholar in Egypt and you ask the question, you'll get a different answer than you get from a Hanafi scholar in Pakistan. Because the Hanafi scholar is going by the Hanafi principle that you start with the Quran. If the ruling of the Quran is clear to the Hanafi scholar, he wouldn't sacrifice that for an isolated report. But if you go to the Shafi scholar, he would go by the isolated report and he would say, this comes from the Prophet and never mind all these different opinions that people give you, just go by the Prophet's statement. Just a different principle. Alright, now we get uh, Ahmed bin Hanbal. Ahmed bin Hanbal was a student of Al-Imam Shafi. Ahmed bin Hanbal could not benefit from Abu Hanifa because he was born some uh, 14 years after the death of um, Imam Abu Hanifa. Nor did he learn from Muhammad bin Hassan al-Shaibani, the one whom Shafi learned from, but he learned from the other students of Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf. See, again there is the interconnectedness. Ahmad bin Hanbal learned from a student of Abu Hanifa. Ahmad bin Hanbal also learned from Al-Imam Shafi. Al-Imam Shafi had learned from Malik. Imam Shafi had also learned from one of the students of Abu Hanifa. There you have all the four. But Ahmad bin Hanbal didn't just lavishly and blindly follow whatever his predecessor said. He didn't say, Imam Shafi is my teacher, so I'll say exactly what he said. No, he formulated his own principle. Imam Shafi's principle regarding hadith is that you accept any hadith of the Prophet so long as it can be proved to be sahih, authentic. Ahmed bin Hanbal now is living in a time when you have more multiplicity of opinions. And in order to get rid of all these opinions, again Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal wants to rely on the hadith from the Prophet wasallam. But the Sahih Hadith only goes so far, you need more. So for him, it is okay to go even with a Hadith which is not Sahih, but weak. It's better to go by a statement which claims to be from the Prophet wasallam than to go by the opinion of men which are so multiple and varied. You do not know which one to rely on. See, as the passage of time goes, people are looking back more towards the Prophet wasallam, such that even if the Hadith are not so defendable, they would prefer to go by the hadith than to go by the opinion of people. And there you have it, four different highways. You cannot say that Ahmed bin Hanbal is totally wrong, nor can you say that a Shafi is totally wrong, or a Malik is totally wrong, or Abu Hanifa is totally wrong. Nor can you say that any one of them is totally right. 
You have to look at what they did, look at their principles and see which ones are beneficial and which ones are not so beneficial. So what we need to be, first of all, is to realize that we should not differ about the minor issues of Islam. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to make these minor issues of any great importance, he would have put it in his book. The companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they knew Islam, more than the rest of us could ever know Islam. In the days of Uthman radiallahu anh, the Qur'an was copied, and that official Qur'an was sent to various parts of the Muslim empire, to all the major centers of learning, so that the Qur'an can become the ruling document. They had that insight to do that. They didn't do the same thing with Hadith. So obviously the Qur'an ranks are of greater importance than anything else. And that is the thing that can unite the Ummah. Now if you look at the problem that we have now, the problem is that we're worrying about the little things which might not be reported dependably, but we're insisting upon this. But the major scholars of Islam did not do this. Today some people say, look, we're a Salafi, which means we're following those scholars, and they might even present Islam mistakenly as though Islam is just one simple, straightforward way that has been followed by all the scholars in the past. And then they say we are Salafi, they mean we follow the ancient scholars by doing the same thing which they did. So you can see right away that the ancient scholars didn't just all simply do the same thing in the details of Islam. Major things of Islam, yes, because that's in the book of Allah sent to all the centers. What they're doing in Medina, according to the Book of Allah, has to be the same in Iraq, has to be the same in Syria, has to be the same in Mecca. So that's the Book of Allah. But in the minor details of Islam, which are not to be tenderly reported, the scholars had room to vary. And what did the major scholars do? They didn't just simply follow blindly what the others did, but each had his own unique approach to Islam. What were they doing in a nutshell? Each one in his own situation was looking for the guidance from Allah and his Prophet to apply it in his situation. So the situations were different. The situations in, uh, uh, for facing Malik was different than the situations facing Abu Hanifa, different from the situations facing Imam Shafi, different from the situations facing Ahmed bin Hanbal. Our situation today is very different than any one of these four situations. Sure, we have some similarities, and where the similarities are, we should have the same application. But where we have different, new, unique problems, we need a new thought. We need a intellectual reintegration. Right now we're in intellectual stagnation. If you go to the books of six today, we have umpteen rulings. Ahmed bin Hanbal said this, Shafi said this, Malik said this. But the original thought is not there. You don't have it that the scholars are willing to go back to reconstruct Islam as it was in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, before the schools were born, before the hadith books were written, try to find out from the book of Allah what was this religion that Allah revealed from about seven heavens, and try to apply that today in our lives. Scholars are not doing this. The scholars went into intellectual stagnation, where they started to write commentaries on the previous books. And when that was not sufficient, they wrote commentaries on the commentaries. And when the commentaries on the commentaries became too big, then they started writing summaries of the commentaries. And today, instead of applying new thought, like our predecessors did, to show how Islam can really be established and how it can flourish and grow in this part of the world, what do they do? They, do, they make translations of what the previous scholars did. So what al Imam in the Taimiyah said, some has um, in today's environment. I tell you it's not going to work. And if we do that, we're not really following our predecessors who applied the original thought by looking at the Quran, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeing how to apply it in their given situation. So then, in a nutshell then, what I've tried to do in this book is to show that Islam is very broad. It is not like a bicycle path. It is not like a mountain path. But it is more like a multi-lane Highway. There are many lanes going in the same direction, and four of those lanes I have described. The schools of Abu Hanifa, uh, of Malik, of Shafi, and Ahmed bin Hanbal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala please with all of them. 
So there is no reason to dispute with each other because one prays with his raising his hand before he goes to Rufu, one says Amin aloud, and one, you know, tries to put his uh, toes on, on the other brother's toes. There's no need to dispute over that. And this is why you will find that when I call people to stand for the Salah, I say stand close together. I do not say put your heels together because I know some people do not put their heels together. And that's okay for them. Some think, no, you must insist, everybody must put their heels together. Why? Just because one school says it, or just because you have one hadith that says it, just because you have a hadith that says it, remember what we said about the scholars. Malik did not accept every hadith. He went by the practice in his town. Because that to him was more dependable than the hadith. And Imam Hanifa did not accept every hadith. Because to him, certain clear analogies, what is called qiyas, was more dependable if it was solidly based than an isolated report in a hadith. So there's no need to quarrel with each other over these things because one says I mean aloud and the other one says it silently. No, we practice Islam concentrating on the core of Islam and not differing over the peel, over the minor issues. And second, if we are really going to establish Islam, as our predecessors did in their time, we must be prepared to rescue ourselves from intellectual stagnation. And another khutbah, inshallah, I will go more into detail to show how intellect has been applied by our predecessors in order to establish Islam and how today Muslims have a fear of using reason and intellect when it comes to speaking about Islam. They think reason is one thing and Islam is another thing. In another khutbah, inshallah, I will demonstrate that the opposite really is true, that faith and reason work together, that Islam and intellect are bound up into one whole, which starts with the revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down, teaching us by the pen and now teaching us by this book.